My second guest is Jan Mitschaika, partner at HV Capital, a brief uh, intro here as well. Um, previously COO at Wuga, a Berlin-based de developer of mobile games um, and a HV investment. Uh, before that, you have co-founded Hitmeister, an e-commerce marketplace later sold to Metro Group. Um, since 2007, you've been an angel investor in almost 20 companies, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, examples include Black Lane, Home Day, sold to Axel Springer, uh, Purple Bricks, Home Like, and self -appear. And so I'm really excited to get to talk to you because you can cover both sides, kind of like. Uh, so um, you have founded and invested. Uh, how does the experience of <laughs> having found it help you in uh, what you do today? It's an interesting question, to be honest, because if I look at our team, about half the investors are career investors who typically come from banking, venture capital, right. etc. Mm -hmm. And the other half are, like myself, people who come from an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. background. And I believe it helps as an investor to feel the pain and share the joy of starting a company. Mm -hmm. mm, I think you have to be very careful about kind of which advice you give. Mm -hmm. I think the worst part is when you have board members who tell you, ah, in my day, we used to use Yahoo. Why don't you use Yahoo for your email? You know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You have to really watch out what part of your knowledge degrades and becomes outdated. On the other hand, I believe things like building a company, organization, motivation, hiring, etc., are parts which where you can then transfer from your experience, having hired hundreds of people, fired hundreds of people, raised money, etc. Mm -hmm. I believe it, um, it helps to then be able to, on the one hand, give factual advice, but then also connect with founders. Mm -hmm. You talked about pain, um, and I'm thinking about all the roadblocks, and there are many roadblocks, obviously, on the way of uh, founding a successful startup. Um, what are the most difficult roadblocks to kind of overcome? Uh, maybe I'm assuming that the, the mental ones are the trickiest ones in a way because you ha really have to fix something inside of yourself instead of um, lobbying, for example. So maybe we mm -hmm. can talk about the mental roadblocks that you might remember from, from founding. Sure. Um, I think the interesting part about being a founder from a psychological perspective is the highs are higher and the lows are lower mm -hmm. than if you're cushioned in some other structure. Mm -hmm. And then I think the key is really to, on the one hand, enjoy the ride, which I think is always super important. Don't mm -hmm. focus too much on kind of the goal, but enjoy the ride while you're doing it. Um, enjoy the highs and then when the lows come, which they always do, tend to be unexpected. Um, I mean, just example, you know, Corona a couple of years ago mm -hmm. where many businesses were significantly impacted. It's not something people had in their heads as a risk. Um, geopolitical issues, interest rates, financial crisis, etc. Mm -hmm. um, these things happen. That's kind of the macro. And then in your micro, you know, it could be, as Christian said before, someone leaving, a customer jumping, whatever it is, mm -hmm. then to have the resilience to, to deal with that and mm -hmm. to find, have sources of strength, which are not only your startup. Mm -hmm. I like the um, macro and micro because um, I think that in the day to day, it might be difficult for founders to kind of not get lost in the micro moments mm -hmm. and kind of keep, uh, we talked about the North uh, Star earlier, kind of keep headed, like just stay headed that way. And so what is the advice you, you would um, give someone who is maybe, you know, dealing with a lot of um, unpleasant emails, for example, like small things, to not lose uh, the, the big vision? Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a good question because I think in general as a founder you should kind of change the levels you're working at. Mm -hmm. um, the frequency maybe depends a bit on the business and which stage you're in. For example, I have um, one founder I work with, um, he decided 
every about six months, he goes into a cabin in the woods for a week mm -hmm. with a long list of things to think about. Mm -hmm. um, he takes his dog, his girlfriend stays home. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't know how that works out <laughs> in their relationship. But um, no, because he says he needs this week every six months to zone out of email. There's no emails, no etc. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because um, I think building a company is a lot of micro decisions mm -hmm. um, in the day to day. But then also once in a while, take a step back, look, how's the world changing? Am I still doing the right thing? Am I going in the right direction, mm -hmm. etc. On the other hand, as a founder, yeah, I don't know if one week per six months is the right time, but you know, you obviously need to also be very close to your business, um, mm -hmm. but find the, find the level to be at once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the sectors uh, you're mostly interested in and actually active in? What are you looking for? So as a firm, um, similar to Cherry Ventures, we're quite generalist. Mm -hmm. And we have certain colleagues of mine, um, for example, partner Barbod in Munich, who only does fintech and mm -hmm. insurtech. Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, he likes it. Um, but then um, it's also <coughs> domain areas where you need specific knowledge around regulation, around the market, you know, Bafin and kind of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have other investors at our firm, like myself, who are more driven by opportunities, you know, who may hear, feel, ah, there's something new, there could be an opportunity, um, longevity was measured, renewables, AI, um, but then you kind of jump on, on new topics. And often what's quite interesting is um, sometimes you find a group of entrepreneurs who at the same time are starting parallel businesses in the mm -hmm. same space. And that's, mm -hmm. I believe, often a really interesting moment mm -hmm. when you notice, ah, there's actually five, six people who came to the same conclusion at the same time mm -hmm. that now is a good time to start something. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, you just, you only have to pick, pick the right one. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you pick the right one? Like, what is your checklist, um, maybe? Uh, when you look at the team, when you look at uh, market, pot market potential, what is the most important one, you would say? Yeah, so I'm a simple person, so I have three criteria. Mm -hmm. um, it's vision, team, and traction. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can go levels deeper into that. I think vision is, to me, always the point about the market, the market size, mm -hmm. um, the growth, but also the profit pools. Mm -hmm. I think there is interesting traditional markets to be explored, you know, where you're suddenly, wow, someone's earning 30, 40, 50% margin on this, can't we mm -hmm. introduce something digital? Mm -hmm. Or a vision could be, I want to change the world in some way, I want to make a dent in the future, mm -hmm. as it's often said. Um, so one is the vision. The second part is the team. What's the connection to the vision? You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you have these quite um, mercenary founders, you know, who kind of skip from topic to topic, etc., and then, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of the topic du jour, you know, maybe yeah. um, let's jump on whatever it is, versus um, a group where um, someone has an intrinsic interest, maybe even earlier conviction than others, etc. Mm -hmm. And the last part is the traction, which could be revenue, because mm -hmm. revenue People often say, ah, oh, German VCs are traditional and boring and old and so on, um, and only invest in companies which are going. I think the point is revenue means someone out there is willing to give you money for what you're doing, mm -hmm. which is pretty strong signal. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have revenue, maybe you have a bunch of users who really like what you're doing, who have retention, engagement, and so on. If you don't have either of those two, then it becomes an investment into vision and team. Um, and maybe like keep people joining, etc. Mm -hmm. But then it's um, it's a bit harder. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to give you the chance to um, make a case for the German-speaking uh, startups um, in a way that everyone's always looking um, to Silicon Valley and mm -hmm. U.S. and China. Um, what do you think um, about the German-speaking area and where we're at when it comes to founding? Mm. So I was pulling some numbers actually on this um, earlier today. What I found interesting is that the VC markets in France and Germany are much more resilient over the last couple of quarters than mm -hmm. UK, US. So mm -hmm. while UK, US have continued to slide down, France and Germany are, are pretty flat mm -hmm. um, the last four quarters. And what I'm seeing and what I'd actually love is for Europe to play to strengths and not to weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of thinking, also in feedback talks and so on, not about like, what's your weakness? How can we work on that? But you know, what's your strength and mm -hmm. how can we multiply that? And um, 
building a global software SaaS company from Europe against Silicon Valley You're companies right. is hard. Right. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's not impossible. I mean, we have examples. On the other hand, we as Europe have strengths. I mean, the most famous, highly capitalized um, company in Europe is Elvermash. You know, we lead the world in taste. Mm -hmm. Why aren't people thinking about that? Um, renewable, super interesting topic, um, mm -hmm. data privacy, medicine, etc. Could be the cases where we have a local advantage um, coming from, from Europe. Mm -hmm. When we talk about innovation, um, real innovation obviously often takes something old and maybe dusty, um, something with a lot of big players and a lot of regulations, um, and everyone has been playing after the same rules for maybe decades, and uh, they want to kind of break down the system and try something new. Um, what's your pitch when it comes to that? Go here, that might be the most interesting space, or is it more like maybe you want to look for something um, easier or easier to handle and manage, like start small or just go for, for the big um, sectors and the big players? I think it's easier as a team when you're in a big sector, mm -hmm. which also has tile wins, you know? So I think mm -hmm. if you're, let's say, if you're an industry which is per se flat, it's not growing, etc., it will be, and it's full, there's a lot of competition, mm -hmm. it will be harder than if you have tail wins. Mm -hmm. And so for many years, I remember, you know, GDP growth in Germany was like whatever, two, three percent, and e-commerce was growing at 15 to 20 percent every mm -hmm. year. So even if you were just an average e-commerce player, yeah. you were growing, You'll you know? Fine. Yeah. And that's a nice position to be in. Mm -hmm. um, and often I think people forget how, through how many pivots companies go. I mean, mm -hmm. even Zalando, like Christian, where they, right. I mean, they started buying these Zapatas in South America and selling them out of an apartment on Torstrasse. Mm -hmm. mm, and then they started selling shoes, then they added fashion. Now they're doing beauty and they've mm -hmm. started to open their logistics, etc. cetera. Um, so often things don't, you know, end up as they started. Yeah, yeah. Are there any areas that you would like to see more activity? Um, we earlier talked about AI, mm -hmm. which might be something when you see the pitch deck, you're just like, oh, there we go again. Um, are there um, sectors that you um, think are underrepresented? Mm -hmm. I think it is, again, playing to our strengths in Europe. So one area we're looking in quite a lot now is everything related to manufacturing industry, because mm -hmm. it's actually quite interesting. You were talking about the US before. Um, the US deindustrialized a huge part of their country mm -hmm. in the end, bringing factories through NAFTA into Mexico, to China, etc. while Germany and France um, mostly also kept an industrial core. Mm -hmm. And so that an, is an area, for example, where we're seeing a lot of interesting startups from robotics, data analytics, IoT, etc. Um, but then I also love consumer startups because I think if you, there was actually an interesting study, it's safer to start a software company, a SaaS company. The outcomes are, so the sum of the outcomes is about the same, B2B and B2C, but mm -hmm. B2C, when it works, it works really well and you're mm -hmm. affecting hundreds of millions of people. Right. And so that's what I like about consumer. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to uh, investing, there are obviously a lot of numbers and criteria you can measure uh, really well. Um, when it comes to really the early stages, uh, stages, there might not be as many numbers to kind of crunch, um, or they might not be as solid. Um, not speaking for HV uh, Capital, but for yourself, how much do you rely on gut feeling and how much space do you give it? Uh, because you simply don't have th the numbers. I think you need well <laughs> a lot of gut to and have a, a gut feeling. Um, the because so much is fuzzy about mm -hmm. the situation, mm -hmm. and so I think if you look at kind of the vision, how's the market going? The team, how do they interact? Will they stay together? Um, who will they hire? Etc. Will they find customers? What we do though, given how generalist we are as a fund, is to do a lot of, um, I spend a lot of time on the phone with people who actually know something, you know, who come from the industry, mm -hmm. reference calls on the founders, on the market, on the tech, etc. Mm -hmm. So in a typical deal process, we'd be speaking to 20 plus people, mm -hmm. um, if not more, 
um, to get a feel, but then you have to condense all this information. And um, what's quite interesting also being in the investment committee then is the stage of building a conviction. Mm -hmm. Do I want to do a deal? Mm -hmm. And then the second part is then the conversion where you then have to win a deal because m many deals still are, especially the interesting ones, competitive mm -hmm. where you have multiple funds mm -hmm. interested. You mentioned the word fuzzy and I, and I like that. Um, and also just thinking about um, I want to say the the human aspects and the um, the people aspects um, in deciding that, which is uh, it's obviously not something that's objective. It's subjective. If you feel like um, that um, a team is working well together, or um, there might be some roadblocks ahead that you might not see um, yet. So, how do you do that? How do you test? if a team is working well together? Do you observe them? Do you mm -hmm. talk to them um, s when they're s uh, separate and not together in a group setting? Like, how do you observe them? I think there's subtle cues. I think it's similar to hiring, where mm -hmm. on the one hand, you mm -hmm. could say maybe you introduce a scorecard, etc. Mm -hmm. You kind of grade, etc. On the other hand, I do believe often um, it, needs to, it needs to click in some way. Mm -hmm. You need to be excited about uh, about the individual founders, but also the team composition, the way they approach things. And um, I think then it's about subtle cues. Uh, for example, that's that was, I mean, during Corona, it wasn't possible. But um, for example, I love walking into startup offices mm -hmm. and I much prefer to go visit the teams rather than to have then them come to us. Them. Because mm -hmm. you see, you know, what are the artifacts on the wall? Are people smiling? Are people in the office at all? Mm -hmm. You know, does someone say hello when you come in and so on? You mm -hmm. know, where you feel, do you feel the energy? Or is mm -hmm. it just a dark, sad place? And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think there's many, kind of many small cues you start to pick up on. Mm -hmm. One cue is kind of culture in mm -hmm. the company, um, which, is that something that has changed? Like, do can you see that? Because it feels like to me sometimes that um, my generation, our generation, has changed that actively because they came from a certain space and they see how things don't work as well. Is that something where you feel like that might be a motivation to found a company that works under uh, or in the ways that I find um, important to me as a person? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a reflection on an experienced founder. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, I mean, it's, uh, founders are also interesting if you look at the statistics and the, and the evidence and so on. On the one hand, you have the Mark Zuckerbergs, you know, college dropouts, mm -hmm. etc., And then you have the seasons, experience, SaaS, software entrepreneurs who have been building, you know, companies for the fourth time, mm -hmm. etc. Um, and neither of the two is, is better or worse. I mm -hmm. think you need to be clear kind of who you're backing of the two. And um, I have one founder, I just met him yesterday evening, for example, who who's had a big exit, um, multiple hundreds of millions, and he sat down and, you know, said, okay, now this is his, I believe, third or fourth company. Mm -hmm and was very deliberate in writing down the attributes he wants the company to have, you know, mm -hmm. kind of based on the learnings of before. Mm -hmm. If you're that type of founder, that's great. If you kind of do it via kind of gut feeling, personality, being the figurehead, that's possible as well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a bit more risky. Mm -hmm. And maybe as a last question, any advice that you would want to give uh, founders or people who think about um, starting uh, something? I think there's no real reason not to do it. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, I mean, I started, so I've never really worked in a company, which maybe HV is the first example, kind mm -hmm. of where, which is more kind of a serious company or mm -hmm. setup. I mean, I started my first company out of university and it was great you know we had no clue what we were doing on the other hand our time was essentially free because you know our living costs were so low mm -hmm. etc um, so that was that was a very cool time to start but then maybe if you're a bit further on in life and you have I'd say six to twelve months of savings mm -hmm. let's put it that way um, why not because mm -hmm. I think we're very 
past the time where it would seen, be seen as something negative to have started a company and failed. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe if you do something extremely stupid, mm -hmm. but um, other than that, I think it's people appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So kind of go for it and uh, yeah, and, and worst try case you and go back to some other you, job. You go afterwards. get a job. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Jan, thank you so much for taking. Thanks the for time. having me. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.